Chapter 14 of Dynamic Thought, or The Law of Vibrant Energy, by William Walker Adkinson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 14 The Mystery of Mind the writer in this book has treated the two manifestations of life viz mind and substance as if they were separate things although he has hinted at his belief that substance at the last might be found to emanate from mind and be but a cruder form of its expression the better way to express the thought would be to say that he believes that both substance and mind as we know it are but expressions of a form of mind as much higher than that which we know as mind as the latter is higher than substance. But he does not intend to follow up this belief in this book, as the field of the work lies along other lines. The idea is mentioned here merely for the purpose of giving a clue to those who might be interested in the conclusions of the writer regarding this more remote regions of the general subject. The writer agrees with the ancient occult teachings regarding the existence of the cosmic mind as he has stated in the last chapter. This cosmic mind, he believes, is independent of substance. In fact, it is the mother of substance and its twin brother, mind as we know it. Mind as we know it, and substance, are always found in connection with other. It is true that the form of substance used by mind as its body may be far finer than the rarest vapor that we know. But it is substance nevertheless. The working of the great plan of the universe seems to require that mind shall always have a body with which to work, and this rule applies not only in the case of the densest form of substance, and the mind principle manifesting through it, but also in the case of the highest manifestation of mind as we know it, which requires a body through which to manifest. This constant combination of mind and substance, the fact that no substance has been found without at least a trace of mind, and no mind except in relation to and combination with substance, has led many scientific thinkers to accept the materialistic idea that mind was but a property of substance, or a quality thereof. Of course these philosophers and thinkers have had to admit that they could form no idea of the real nature of mind, and could not conceive how substance really could think. But they found the materialistic idea a simpler one than its opposite, and so they fell into it, notwithstanding the fact that there was always a something within that would cry pshaw at the conclusion of the argument or illustration these men have thought it reasonable to believe that there was no such thing as mind except as a result of irritation of tissue etc but nevertheless there was always a something in us that in spite of argument keeps crying like a child taint so and wonderful to relate we heed the little voice this materialistic theory is a curious reversal of the facts of the case. Even the very conclusions and reasoning of these thinkers is made possible only by the existence of that mind which they would deny. The human reason is incapable of explaining the inner operation of the mind upon a strictly and purely physical basis. Tyndall, the great English scientist, truthfully said, The passage from the physics of the brain to the corresponding facts of consciousness is unthinkable. Granted that a definite thought and a definite molecular action of the brain occur simultaneously, we do not possess the intellectual organ, nor apparently any rudiment of the organ, which would enable us to pass by a process of reasoning from the one phenomenon to the other. The materialist is prone to an attempt to rout the advocates of mind with a demand for an answer to the question, What is mind? The best answer to that question lies along the proverbial Irishman's lines of answering a question by asking another one, resulting in the answering question, What is matter? As a fact, the human reason is unable to give an intelligent answer to either question, and the best opinion seems to be to consider them as but two aspects of something, the real origin of which lies in something higher, of which both are aspects or forms of expression. The occult teaching with which the writer agrees is that the mind inherent in any portion of substance, from the corpuscle up to the brain of man, is but a segregated, or apparently separated, portion of the universal mind principle, or cosmic mind. This fragment of mind is always connected with substance, and in fact it is believed that it is separated from the universal mind, 
and the other separate minds by a film of the rarest substance, so fine as to be scarcely distinguishable from mind. This separation is not a total separation, however, for the fragment of mind is in connection with all other fragments of mind by mental filaments, and besides is never out of touch with the cosmic mind. But comparatively, the fragment of mind is apart from the rest, and we must consider it in this way at least for the purpose of study, consideration, and illustration. It is like a drop in the ocean of mind, although connected in a way with every other drop and the ocean itself. The individual mind is not closely confined within the substance in which it abides, but extends beyond the physical limits of the substance, sometimes to quite a considerable distance. The aura, or egg-shaped projection or emanation of mind surrounding each particle and each individual, is an instance of this. In addition to the aura there is possibly an extension of mind to a considerable distance, beyond the immediate vicinity of the physical limits, the connection, however, never being broken during the life-term. Mental influence at a distance, however, does not always require the above-mentioned projection of the mind. Thought waves often answer the purpose, and besides, there is such a thing as the imparting of mental vibrations to the small particles of substances with which the atmosphere is filled, which vibrations continue for quite a time, often for a long period after the presence of the individual producing them. These matters shall be discussed in later chapters of this book. The mind of man is a far more complex thing that is generally imagined by the average man. Not only in its varied manifestation of consciousness, but its great region of below consciousness, or infraconsciousness, as it is called. It shall be the purpose of the sequel to this book, now in preparation, which will be entitled The Wonders of the Mind, to describe these inner workings and to point out methods of utilizing the same. Our next chapter, entitled The Finer Forces of the Mind, will lead us into this field. End of chapter 14. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 12 of Dynamic Thought, or The Law of Vibrant Energy, by William Walker Atkinson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Preston of Los Angeles, California. Chapter 12 The Law of Vibrant Energy In previous chapters we have seen that the phenomena of radiant energy, known as light, heat, magnetism, and electricity, had their origin in the motion of the particles. The different classes of phenomena, depending upon the particular degree and nature of the aforesaid motion of particles. We have seen also that radiant energy could be communicated or transmitted from one body of substance to another, and that the communication of transmission might be accomplished not only by close contact of the bodies, but by waves of some sort which were caused in some medium, the ether, by the vibrations of the particles of the body, and which waves when they reached the other body, were transformed into vibrations of the particles corresponding to those manifested in the first body. The idea has been illustrated by the sending telephone, the sound waves in the diaphragm of which were transformed into waves of the electric current, and thus passing along the wires were transformed again into sound waves by the diaphragm of the receiving instrument. We have seen, also, in the preceding chapter, that the medium by which these vibrations were transferred, transmitted, or communicated, might be supposed to be mind, the operation being akin to thought transference. Now, let us examine into the workings of the matter. In the first place, we assume a certain state of vibration existing in a certain body of substance, heat or electricity, for instance. Either illustration will answer. Another body of substance is brought in close contact with the first body 
and the vibrations of energy pass on to the second, not by waves, but by a seeming actual passing of vibrations without the need of intervening waves. This science calls transmission by conduction, the theory being that the particles rapidly pass on the vibrations from one to another. Convection or conduction, along other forms of substance, such as hot air, hot water, steam, etc., is but a variation of the above, as substance is the medium in both cases. The third form of transmission is by radiation, whereby the vibrations are transmitted by waves in some medium other than substance, according to the theory as we have described in a preceding paragraph, as well as in previous chapters. As a matter of fact, a careful analysis of the matter will show that even in the conduction of the most solid substance, there must be a medium, not substance, between the particles of the substance, for the particles always have space between them. This being true of the particles of air, as well as those of iron. So there is always space to be traversed by a medium, not substance. But we need not stop to split hairs regarding this question, for the general explanation will explain this also. Now, to get back to our body of substance, vibrating with radiant energy, separated from a second body of substance by a great distance, thousands of miles, in fact. Millions would be better. Let us take two worlds, for instance, the sun and the earth, ignoring for the moment the explanation of gravitations, which will be given later, and realizing that there is no medium of substance existing between the two bodies. We must grant that there is a medium, not substance, existing between them, either permanently or thrown out for the purpose of this special transmission. We shall assume a medium existing before the need of the transmission, for reasons to be seen later. Our theory of dynamic thought and thought transference between bodies of substance compels us to suppose that this medium is a mental connection or mental relation existing between the two bodies of substance. So, we must consider the question of this medium of mind transmitting the vibrations of radiant energy from the sun to the earth. How can mind conduct radiant energy? It does not conduct radiant energy, but it does transmit. Not radiant energy, but the mental state that causes radiant energy vibrations. This statement of a mental state causing radiant energy vibrations seems rather startling at first sight, but let us examine it. We have seen that the radiant energy was caused by the motion or vibrations of the particles, which motion or vibration was the result of the workings of the law of attraction, and which law was but the manifestation a vital mental action, and at the last, the vibrations of radiant energy are the result of peculiar or particular states of the life and mind of the particle. The word state is derived from the Latin word status, meaning position, standing, and is used generally in the sense of condition. This mental state of the particle may be described as a state of emotional excitement. Let us pause a moment to consider the meaning of these words. It often helps us to understand a subject if we examine the real meaning of the words defining it. Emotion is derived from the Latin word emotum, meaning to shake, to stir up, the Latin word being made up of two other words, i.e., e meaning out and motum to move. Emotion is defined as a moving or excitement of the mind. Excitement is derived from the Latin word exciter, meaning to move out, 
the English word being defined as a calling to activity, state of active feeling, aroused activity. So you see that the idea of active motion and aroused activity of mind permeates the term emotional excitement that is used by the writer in connection with the mental state causing vibration of the particles of substance. The single word excitement will be used by the writer hereafter in the above connection in order to avoid complex terms. To those who still object to the use of a mental term in reference to motion of substance, he might remark that science makes use of the term excite and excitement in reference to electrical phenomena, so that he is not altogether without support in the use of the word. Now, to return again to our body of substance, the sun, the particles of which are manifesting a great degree of excitement, evidencing in vibrations producing the phenomena of radiant energy. The excitement is shared equally by its particles, the contagion having spread among them. Even the particles of its atmosphere are vibrating with excitement and evidencing radiant energy. The sun is in direct mental connection with the earth, as we shall see presently, and the excitement is transmitted by thought transference along this mental connection in the shape of dynamic thought waves of excitement. These waves have a rate of speed of 184,000 miles per second. Why this particular rate, or any rate at all, is not apparent it being very evident. However, that this particular kind of mental action, excitement, or thought is not transmitted instantaneously, as is the mental quality known as desire, resulting in an attraction or gravitation, which seems to be rather a basic quality rather than a temporary disturbance or emotional excitement. But the writer must not get ahead of his story. The excitement of the particles of substance composing the sun is contagious, and the thought waves travel along the mental connection or medium at a wonderful rate of speed. Soon they come in contact with the mental atmosphere of the earth, and the excitement becomes manifest in action. The emotional excitement being reproduced by the particles of the earth's substance nearest the surface which vibrate and manifest the radiant energy in spite of themselves for the tendency among particles is to settle down and remain calm rather than to participate in emotional excitement they have acquired a normal and fixed rate of vibration or mental state after many years gradually changing from a high state of excitement to a comparative calm state, and their tendency and inclination is conservative, and they are disposed to resent and repel radical states of excitement or disturbance coming from other less conservative bodies. The above fact partially explains why the communicated excitement manifests itself more strongly on the surface of the body exposed to the contagion of excitement. The conservative influence is always at work and manages to absorb and equally distribute the energy that is beating down upon it without allowing it to penetrate very far. The energy is used up or absorbed and neutralized by the lower vibrations of the mass. The effort of the energy coming from the sending body is to bring up the vibrations of the receiving body to the rate of the sender, while the effort of the receiving body is to resist this effort and to reduce and bring down the transmitted increased rate of vibration of the particles immediately exposed to the contagion. In both cases, the effort is toward equalization of the rate of vibrations. This working of the law may be observed plainly in the case of heat vibrations. 
the energy seeming to wish to bring up the vibrations or temperature of the second body while the latter resists this effort and strives to bring down the vibrations or temperature of those particles of itself that have caught the motion the energy is like a radical agitator who wishes to stir up an excitement leading to a change while the body is like the conservative element that prefers to let well enough alone and resists the stirring up process and exerts itself to restore quiet and to maintain accustomed conditions the explanation of the phenomenon given in any work on physics or natural philosophy will answer fairly well in the consideration of this theory of dynamic thought the only important change being required being the substitution of thought waves for waves of the ether of science science has described the working operations as might be expected from her years of careful study and examination she has erred only in the theory or hypothesis advanced to account for the facts her ether handed down by aristotle is admitted by her to be paradoxical and unthinkable but she has had none other to substitute for it she will probably sneer at the dynamic thought and thought transference theory advanced in this book if indeed she takes the trouble to examine it but sometime from her own ranks among her most advanced members will arise a man who will claim that all force is mental force and that transference of energy is thought transference and the scientific world will accept the doctrine after it finds itself unable to fight it down and it will give new names and terms to its workings and it will proclaim loudly the new truth and this little book and its writer will be ignored but its work will go on the writer although probably doomed to have himself and his theory laughed at by the masses of people whose children will accept the teachings of this book does not feel discouraged by the prospect he cares nothing for personal credit the truth being the important thing like galvini whose words appear on the title page of this book he may cry i am attacked by two very opposite sects the scientists and the know nothings both laugh at me calling me the frog's dancing master but i know that i have discovered one of the greatest forces in nature the illustration given above of the transmission of the excitement of the particles of the sun to the particles of the earth will answer equally well in the case of light heat magnetism and electricity and it will answer in the case of the transmission of these forces between atoms molecules and masses as well as between worlds and solar systems any body subject to the law of attraction may and do so transmit vibrations in our consideration of the riddle of the sphinx which forms the subject of the next chapter we shall obtain further particulars of the workings of the law the consideration of the facts and principles stated in this chapter brings us to a second supplemental proposition which may be stated as follows supplemental proposition two the rates of vibration of the particles of substance may be likened to mental states and a high degree of the same may be called an excitement this excitement may be and is communicated from the particles of the body manifesting it to the particles of other bodies the medium of such communication being a mental connection or mental relation existing between the two bodies of substance without the employment of any material medium and which excitement so communicated reproduces in the second body the vibrations manifested in the first body subject always to the counteracting efforts of the second body to maintain its accustomed and former rate of vibration and mental state end of chapter 12
Recording by Jill Preston. Chapter 13 of Dynamic Thought or The Law of Vibrant Energy by William Walker Atkinson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. Chapter 13 The Riddle of the Sphinx. It is with no light emotion or jaunty air that the writer approaches this part of his subject. On the contrary, he feels something like awe when he contemplates the nature of that great something which he is called upon to attempt to explain in a few pages. He feels, in only a lighter degree, the emotion that one experiences when, in occasional moments, his mind leads to a contemplation of the infinite. He feels that which men mean when they say gravitation and the ether are but symbols and feeble concepts of something so far above human experience that the mind of man may grasp only its lowest shadings the greater and higher part of it like the higher rays of the spectrum being hidden from the experience of man in his endeavour to pass on to you his ideas regarding the something that explains both gravitation and the ether he must ask you to endeavour to form a mental picture of a something this something must fill all space within the limits of the universe or cosmos if limits it has it must be an expression of the first of the attributes of the infinite the one called omnipresence or presence everywhere and yet it must not be the infinite presence it also must be an expression of the second of the attributes of the infinite the one called omnipotence or all power and yet it must not be the infinite power it also must be an expression of the third attribute of the infinite it's the one called omniscience or all-knowing and yet it must not be the infinite wisdom it must be an expression of all the attributes that we think of as belonging to the infinite and yet through them all we may see the infinite itself in the backgrounds viewing its expressions the something that you are asked to think of is that something regarding which the mystics have dreamed the philosophers have speculated the scientists have sneered and smiled that something that men have thought of as the universal mind or the cosmic mind you are asked to think of this something as a great ocean of pure mind permeating all space between solar systems between worlds between masses of substance between the molecules atoms and corpuscles in and about and around everything yes even in everything in the very essence of the corpuscle it is in truth it is that essence itself bound up in the bosom of that mighty ocean of mind must reside all knowledge of the universe of all this side of god for that all knowledge is but a knowing of its own region latent within itself must be locked up all energy all capacity for force or motion for all force or energy is mental in its presence it exemplifies the capacity of filling all space omnipresent omnipotent omniscient all the attributes of the infinite are manifested in it and yet it is but the outward expression of that behind the veil which is the causeless cause of all in that great ocean of universal or cosmic mind bodies of substance are but as floating specks of dust or even bubbles formed of the substance of that ocean itself on the surface of that ocean there may arise waves currents ripples eddies whirlpools storms hurricanes tempests from its bosom may rise vapour that after stage of clouds raindrops flowing in streams rivers bays at last again reach the source of its origin 
these substances are changes we call energy force motion but they are but surface manifestations and the great ocean is serene in its depths and in reality is unchanged and undisturbed this friends is that which the writer asks you to accept in the place of aristotle's ether is it a worthy exchange we have seen that the attraction of gravitation was different from any other so-called form of force and energy both in its operations and laws as well as in its constancy and self-support and that it was different from the other forms of attraction such as cohesion chemical affinity etc and so we must consider it as more than a mere emotional excitement in the mind of the particle that bubble on the surface of the ocean and it must be different from the special forms of attraction manifested by the atom and molecule it must be a simpler more basic and yet a more constant and a permanent thing it must exist before and after excitement vibration cohesion and chemical affinity it must be the mother of the forces let us imagine the cosmic mind as a great body of something filling space instead of as the surface of the ocean which figure we used just now either figure is equally correct this great cosmic mind is to be thought of as a filling space and containing within its volume oh for a better word countless worlds and suns as well as smaller bodies of substance these suns and world and bodies are apparently free and unconnected floating in this great volume of mind but they are not free and unconnected they are linked together by a web of lines of gravitation each body of substance has a line reaching out in a continuous direction and connecting it with another body each body has one of such lines connecting it with each particular other body consequently each body has countless lines reaching out from it some slender and some thick the thickness depending upon the ratio of distances maintained by and relative sizes of the particular bodies that it connects this system of lines form a great network of connections in the volume of mind crossing each other at countless points but not interfering with each other and although the number may be said to be countless still these lines do not begin to cover the entire dimensions of space or of the mind that fills it there are great areas of space entirely untouched by these lines if one could see the system of lines it probably would appear as a sheared off section of a great spider's web with lines in all directions but with plenty of room between the lines perhaps these lines converge to a common centre and that centre may be but this is transcendental dreaming let us proceed with our consideration of the use of these lines it is to be understood of course that these lines are not material lines not made of substance but rather conditions in the cosmic mind not thought waves arising from the excitement of particles but something more basic simpler and more permanent let us look closer and we shall see the great lines of gravitation radiating from and connecting world with world sun with planet are really cables composed of much smaller lines the finest strands of which are seen to emanate from each corpuscle or particle of substance the line of gravitation reaching from the earth to the sun being composed of a mass of tiny strands which connect each particle of one body with each particle of the other the last analysis shows us that each particle is connected with every other particle in the universe by a line of attraction these lines of attraction are what we call gravitation purely mental in nature lines of mind principle in the great volume of mind these lines of gravitation must have existed from the creation of the particle and the connection between particle and particles 
must have existed from the beginning beginning there was the particles may have changed their positions and relations in the universe but the lines have never been broken whether the particle existed as a free corpuscle whether combined as atom or molecule whether part of this world or sun or planet or that one countless millions of miles removed it mattered not the line of gravitation always was there between that particle and every other particle distance extended and thinned the line or the reverse as the case might be but it was there always obstacles proved no hindrance to passage for the lines passed through the obstacle can it not be seen that here is the secret of the fact that no time is required for the passage of gravitation it apparently travelling instantaneously whereas in fact it does not travel at all and does not seem that this theory also explains why no medium is required for the travel of gravitation and does it not explain why gravitation is not affected in its passage by intervening bodies gravitation does not travel or pass it remains constant and ever present between the articles varying in degree as the distance between the particles is increased and vice versa and increasing and decreasing in effect according to the number of particles combining their lines of attraction as in the case of atom molecule mass world gravitation is a mental connection or bond united the mind in the several particles rather than their substance or material along these lines of gravitation pass the thought waves resulting from the excitement of the particles these fleeting changing inconstant waves of emotion how different they are from the changeless constant exhibition of gravitation and among these same lines when shortened by close contact travel the impulses of cohesion and chemical affinity gravitation not only performs its own work but also acts as a common carrier for the waves of desire force and the thought waves of excitement of the particles manifesting as attractive energy and radiant energy respectively the writer asks you to remember particularly that while the desire waves of the particles and their thought waves of excitement are changeable disconnected and inconstant the line of gravitation is never broken and could not be unless the particle of substance was swept out of existence in which case the balance of the universe would be overturned and chaos would result the divine plan is perfect to the finest detail every particle is needed is known is counted and used in the plan and gravitation is the plainest evidence of the reality of the infinite that is afforded us in it we see the actual machinery of the infinite no wonder that great thinkers have bowed their heads reverently before its power and awfulness when the minds have finally grasped its import verily the sparrow's fall is noted and known as the biblical writer has recorded for the fall is in obedience to that great law that holds the particles in their places that makes possible the world of worlds and the existence of solar systems that indeed makes possible the forms of life as we know them that something that forever and ever has and will silently ceaselessly and tiringly and without emotion fulfilled its work and destiny gravitation the theory of dynamic thought also holds that in addition to the existence of the cosmic mind or ocean of the mind principle and the lines of attraction that run through it each particle has its mental atmosphere or aura the aura is an atmosphere of mind that surrounds the particle and also the larger bodies and also living forms higher in the scale this aura is merely an extension of the bit of mind that is segregated or apparently separated from the cosmic mind 
for use by the individual particle mass or creature through and by means of this aura the particle takes cognizance of the approach and nature of the other particles in its vicinity the same rule holds good in the case of the creatures including man as we shall see in a later chapter the fact is mentioned here merely in order to connect the several manifestation of mental phenomena mentioned in the several parts of this book some may object to the theory of the lines of gravitation being the only carriers of the energy of the sun as being contrary to the conception of science that the sun radiates energy in all directions equally just as does a piece of hot iron or a lamp answering this objection the writer would say that there is a decided difference in the two cases the iron or lamp radiates its heat and light to the particles of the surrounding air and other substance in close distance the lines being very close together so close in fact that they seem to be continuous and having no space between them at least no space sufficiently large to be detected by the eye of man or his instruments but with the sun the case is different for the distances are greater and the lines spread apart as the distance is increased draw a diagram of many fine x-rays emanating from a central point and you will have the idea at once if space were filled with substance just as is the atmosphere of the earth the air is meant of course then indeed would the lines practically be joined together but as space between the worlds is almost devoid of substance the lines between the sun and the other worlds and planets spread out rapidly as the distance from the sun increases to show how this objection is really an additional proof of the theory the writer begs to call your attention to the fact that according to the calculations of the physicists in science the sun's energy would have been exhausted in twenty million years granting that it was dispersed equally in all directions during that time but note this science in its other branches namely in geology etc holds that the sun already has been throwing out energy for five hundred million years or more five hundred million or more years and seems able to stand the strain for many millions of years more thus science is arrayed against science does not this theory harmonize the two by showing that the sun does not emanate energy in all directions equally and at all times but on the contrary radiates energy only along the lines of gravitation and in proportion to the relative distances and sizes of the bodies to whom such energy is radiated the writer need scarcely state that in the short space at his disposal in the pages of this book he has been able merely to outline his theory of dynamic force as applied to the inorganic world the patience of the average reader has limits we must pass on to other features of the workings of the theory namely the mental life of man in which the name laws are manifested but he feels that those interested in the phases of the subject touched upon may explain for themselves the missing details by reference to the teachings of modern science on the subjects of physics remembering always to substitute the theory of dynamic thought for the ether theory that modern science borrows from aristotle as a temporary makeshift the writer believes that this theory will account for many of the missing links in physics a broad statement he knows and one either extremely impudent or superbly confident according to the viewpoint of the critic the writer may be able to throw a little additional light probably upon the question of the relation between gravitation and the excitement waves of radiant energy without attempting to go into details he wishes to suggest that in view of the fact that the particles are connected by the lines of gravitation any great extended and rapid disturbance of a number of particles 
would cause a series of undulating or wave-like movements in the lines which might be spoken of as waves of agitation or unrest in the lines of gravitation this agitation or unrest of course would be thus communicated to all other particles toward whom lines extended the intensity or effect of such agitation or unrest depending upon the relative distances and the number of particles involved we may easily imagine how the intense and high rate of vibration among the particles of the sun manifesting as intense heat would cause a like high degree of agitation or unrest among the lines of gravitation the lines dancing backward and forward around and about following the movements of the particles and thus producing waves of gravitational agitation and unrest which when communicated to the particles of the earth would produce a similar excitement among the particles of the latter in the same way the sunspots and consequent terrestrial electrical disturbance may be explained by not absolutely trying himself to this particular conception of the details of the workings of the law the writer feels free to say that he considers it a very reasonable idea and one that in all probability will be found to come nearer to explaining the phenomena than any other hypothesis it certainly coincides with the undulatory wave theory of science the idea is but crudely expressed here for lack of space it being impossible to attempt to go into details the mere mention of general principles being all that is possible at this time and space and now for a few additional words on the subject of our theory that in place of the hypothetical ether of science a substance that is not substance there exists a great ocean of cosmic mind the idea is not without corroborative proof in the direction of the thought of advanced thinkers even among the ranks of science while science has accustomed the public to the idea that in the universal ether might be found the origin of matter the essence of energy the secret of motion it has not spoken of mind in connection with this universal something but the idea is not altogether new and some daring scientific thinkers have placed themselves on record regarding the same let us quote from a few of them it will make smoother our path edward drinker cope and several of his writings hinted at the idea that the basis of life and consciousness lay back of the atoms and might be found in the universal ether dolbia says possibly the ether may be the medium through which mind and matter react hemstreet says mind in the ether is no more unnatural than mind in flesh and blood stockwell says the ether is coming to be apprehended as an immaterial superphysical substance filling all space carrying in its infinite throbbing bosom the specks of aggregated dynamic force called worlds it embodies the ultimate spiritual principle and represents the unity of those forces and energies from which spring as their source all phenomena physical mental and spiritual as they are known to man dolby speaks of the ether as a substance which besides the function of energy and motion has other inherent properties out of which could emerge under proper circumstances other phenomena such as life or mind or whatever may be in the substratum newton spoke of it as a subtle spirit or immaterial substance dolby says the ether the properties of which we vainly strive to interpret in the terms of matter the undiscovered properties of which ought to warn every one against the danger of strongly asserting what is possible and what is impossible in the nature of things stockwell says that the ether is not matter in any of its forms practical scientists are agreed scientists are agreed dalbier again says if the ether that fills all space is not atomic in structure presents no friction to bodies moving through it and is not subject to the law of gravitation 
it does not seem proper to call it matter one might speak of it as a substance if he wants another name for it as for myself i make a sharp distinction between the ether and matter and feel somewhat confused to hear one speak of the ether as matter and yet in spite of the above expressions no scientist has dared to say in plain words that the ether or whatever took the place of the ether must be mind although several seem to be on the verge of the declaration but apparently afraid to voice their thought in view of what we have seen in our consideration of the facts and principles advanced in this chapter we are invited to consider the following two supplemental propositions supplemental proposition three connecting each particle of substance with each and every other particle of substance there exist lines of mental connection the thickness of which depends upon the distance between the two particles decreasing in proportion as the distance is increased these lines may be considered as conditions of the great ocean of cosmic mind which pervades and fills all space including the essence of inner being of the particles of substance as well as the space between the said particles these lines are the lines of gravitation by and over which the phenomenon of gravitation is manifested these lines of gravitation have always existed between each particle and every other particle and have persisted continuously and constantly throughout all the changes of condition and position and relation that the particles have undergone there is no passage or transmission of energy or force of gravitation over these lines or any other channel but on the contrary the energy or force of gravitation is a constant and continuous mental connection or bond existing between the mind of the particles rather than between their substance or material supplemental proposition four the lines of gravitation mentioned in the preceding proposition are the medium over which travel or are transmitted the thought waves resulting from the excitement of the particles and by which waves the mental states are communicated or transmitted the same medium transmits or carries the mental force of attraction cohesion chemical affinity etc evidencing in the relation of the particles to each other thus gravitation not only performs its own work but also acts as a common carrier for the waves of excitement manifesting as radiant energy and the waves of desire force manifesting as attractive energy and here the writer rests his case in the action in the forum of advanced thought entitled the theory of dynamic thought versus the theory of aristotle's ether in which he appears for the plaintiff he begs that you the members of the jury will give to the evidence and argument due consideration to the end that you may render a just verdict end of chapter thirteen chapter fifteen of dynamic thought or the law of vibrant energy by william walker atkinson this is a LibreVox recording all LibreVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibreVox.org. recording by elaine conway england chapter fifteen the finer forces of the mind it was the writer's original intention to close the book with a chapter in which he brought to a close his argument and presentation of the case of dynamic thought the book was written for the purpose of demonstrating that theory and it naturally should have closed there the writer has in simultaneous course of preparation a companion book entitled the wonders of the mind in which in addition to information and instruction 
regarding the latent powers and hidden regions of the mind including an investigation of the infraconscious and ultra-conscious regions automatic thinking occult systems of mentation mental development and unfoldment etc he purposes taking up the subject of dynamic thought from the mental plane of man but he thought it better to keep the two branches of the subject separate and apart but notwithstanding the above facts he feels that he cannot close the present book the consideration of the present phase of the subject without at least a passing reference to the fact that dynamic thought is fully operative on the plane of human mentation as on the plane of atomic mentation in fact man has the same power potentially that is possessed by the atom only refined to a degree corresponding to the development of man as compared to that of the atom the power is raised to a higher plane of mentation but is fully operative just as the body of man contains physical life corresponding with the different phases of lower physical life mineral vegetable and animal for instance the mineral like bones and the mineral salts in the system the plant-like life and work of the cells and the animal-like flesh and physical life in addition to the wonderful brain structure and fine brain development peculiar to man so has man the lower mental qualities of the lower life in addition to his glorious human consciousness that is reserved the highest form of life on the globe in his mental regions man has the power of the atom of attracting articles of substance to him that he may combine it with other substances in building up his body then he has the plant-like cell mentation that does the building up work and repairs wounds and damaged parts etc then he has the animal mentation evidencing in the passions desires and emotions of the purely animal nature and which mentation by the way keeps man busy in controlling by means of his higher mental faculties that are god's gift to man and are not possessed by the animals but all this will form part of the sequel the wonders of the mind and are merely mentioned here in passing and just as man is enabled to use elementary the physical qualities that he finds in his body and to turn sane to good account in living his human life so does man consciously or unconsciously make use of these elementary mental powers in his everyday mental life and if he but realises what a conscious use of these faculties guided by the human will will do many may become a different order of being this is the basis of the occult teachings and the mysteries of the ancients as well as the teachings of the modern secret esoteric bodies and societies such as the rosicrucians and hermetic brotherhood and several other societies whose names are not known the real societies are referred to not the brazen imitations that unscrupulous men are holding out to the public as the original orders membership being offered and urged for the consideration of a few dollars it is needless to say that membership in the real occult orders is never urged and cannot be bought but to return to the subject the individual mind of man is in direct touch not only with the great cosmic mind but also with the individual mind of every other man just as the particles are bound by lines of attraction so are the minds of men bound together by lines of mind or mental filaments and just as special forms of attraction exist between the particles so do special forms of attraction exist between men and just as particles are influenced at the distance by other particles so are men influenced at the distance by other men and just as the particle draws toward itself that which it desires so do men draw toward themselves that which they desire 
and just as mental states and excitement are transmitted or communicated from particle to particle so are mental states or excitement transmitted or communicated from men to men as above so below as below so above says the old occult maxim and it may be found to operate on every plane the phenomena of thought transference telepathy telesthesia mental projection suggestion hypnotism mesmerism etc etc may be explained and understood by reason of an acquaintance with the theory of dynamic thought as explained in this book an understanding of one gives you the key to the other for the law operates precisely the same on each particular plane if the reader will think over this statement and then apply it to his investigations and experiments he will find that he has the key to many mysteries the loose end of a mighty ball of thread which he may unwind at his leisure let us begin by consideration of the process of thought production in the human mind in this way we may arrive at a clearer idea of the mental phenomena known as thought force mental power thought waves thought vibrations mind transference mental influence etc to understand these things we must begin by understanding the process of thought production here is found the secret of the phenomena named and much more in the first place while the brain is the organ of the mind the instrument that the mind uses in producing thought still the brain does not do the thinking nor is the brain matter visible to the eye the material instrument of thinking the brain and other portions of the nervous systems including the little brains or ganglia found in various parts of the body is composed of a certain substance a fine form of plasm which however is but the groundwork of foundation for finer forms of substance used in the production of thought science has not discovered this finer substance for it is not visible to the eye or to the finest instruments but trained oculists know that it exists this finer substance escapes the scalpel and microscope of the biologists and anatomists and consequently their search for mind in the brain is futile there is something more than tissue to be irritated in the brain but remember that this something more is still substance and not mind itself thought is a form of excitement in this fine brain substance which we may as well call psychoplasm from the two greek words meaning the mind and a mould or matrix respectively the combined word meaning the mould or matrix of mind or matrix of mind in other words the material substance used by the mind in which to cast or mould thoughts this excitement in the psychoplasm manifests in vibrations of its particles for like all substances it has particles all scientists agree that in the process of thinking there is an expenditure of energy and a using up of material substance just how this is affected they do not know but their experiments have known that there is energy manifested and used and also substance consumed the secret of the production of thought does not lie in the brain or nervous system which are but the material substratum upon which the mind works and which it uses as a mould or matrix for the production of thought thought is the product of mind directing force upon substance in the shape of psychoplasm and energy is manifested in the production of thought just as much as in the operation of the law of attraction or chemical action what force and energy may be asked the answer is mental force but although the answer stares them right in the face scientists deny that mind contains force or energy within itself and persist in thinking of force as a mechanical thing 
or as necessarily derived from the common forms of energy such as heat light or electricity they ignore the fact that mind has a minor force which it uses to perform its work how do the atoms attract each other and move together there is an evidence of force and energy here that is not heat light or electricity what is it when a man wishes to close his hand he wills that it be closed and sends a current from this finer force of the mind along the nerve to the muscle and the latter contracts and the hand is closed a similar process is used in every muscular action what is the force used what is the force used science admits the existence of this force and calls it nervous energy or nerve force it holds that it must be something like electricity and some even go so far as to say that it is electricity they base their ideas upon the fact that when electricity is applied to the muscle of living or dead animals they contract as they do when this nerve force is applied and every movement of the muscle may be so produced by electricity which becomes a counterfeit nerve force but here is the point this force cannot be identical with electricity for none of the appliances for registering electric currents will register it it is not electricity but is some finer force of the mind generated in the material substratum that the mind uses as a base of operation this fine force of the mind is generated in some way in the brain and nervous system by action upon the psychoplasm the brain or brains for man has several centres worthy of that term are like great dynamos and storehouses of this force and the nerves are the wires that carry it to all parts of the system more than this the nerves have been found to be generators of force also as well as the brain experiments have shown that the supply of force in a nerve vanishes when the nerve is used in which case it draws upon the storehouses for an additional supply this fine force of the mind is really the source of all energy for as we have shown in previous chapters all motion arises from mental action and this form of force or energy is the primal force or energy produced by the mind and this force is in operation in all forms of life from the atom to the man and not only may it be used by the particle but man also has it at his disposal as a proof that substance is used up and energy manifested in the production of thought science points to the fact that the temperature of a nerve rises when it is used and the temperature of the brain increases when it is used for extended thought scientists have claimed and advanced a mass of proof to back up the same that thought was as much a form of energy as was the pulling of a train of cars and was attended by the production of a definite amount of heat resulting from the activity of the fine substance of the physical extended resistant and composite substratum but science has taken all this to mean that thought and mind were purely material things and properties of matter it has claimed that matter thinks instead of that mind uses the matter or substance in its finer forms as a substratum for the production of thought buchner the leader of the purely materialistic school claims positively that thought is but the product of matter he says it is not a patent fact of obvious to all but to the wilfully blind that matter does think de la Maitre made merry over the narrowness of the mentalists in saying when people ask where the matter can think it is as though they asked where the matter can strike the hours matter indeed as such thinks as little as it strikes the hours but it does both when brought into such conditions that thinking or hour striking results as a natural action or performance the above quoted opinion of buchner 
shows how narrow and one-sided a talented man may become by reason of shutting out all the other points of view and seeing only one phase of a subject the example of the hour striking is a poor figure of the materialists for although matter does strike the hours it does so only when wound up by man under direction of his mind and in the manufacture adjustment and winding of the clock mind is the cause of the action and more than this the very action of the coiled spring that is the immediate cause of the striking results from the mental effort of the particles of the spring endeavouring to resume their accustomed position under the law of elasticity as explained in our chapters on substance science renders valuable service in showing us the details of the mechanism of thought but it will never really explain anything unless it assumes the existence of mind back of and in everything it may dissect the brain cells and show us their composition but it never will find mind under the scalpel or in the scale or test tube not only is this true but it cannot even discover the fine psychoplasm which is used in the production of mind but we may make use of its investigations regarding the matter of activity of brain substance in the process of thought and by combining them with our belief regarding the existence of mind we may form a complete chain of reasoning without any missing links these missing links appearing both in the case of the no mind philosophers and the no matter metaphysicians this theory of mind and substance considered as the two aspects of something higher from which both have originated or emanated will come to be regarded as the only thinkable proposition in the end and with this idea in view we may use the facts and experiments of the materialists while smiling at their theories and with but a slight change of words we may turn against them their own verbal batteries in this way we may take molescott's famous statement thought is but a motion of matter and render it intelligible by making it read as follows thought produces motion in matter this finer force of the mind is in full evidence to those who look for it and although it may not be registered by the scales or instruments designed to register the coarser grades of force still it is registered in the minds of men and women and in the actions resulting from their thoughts these living registers of the force respond readily to it and every one of us is such a register just as is the force a much higher grade of energy than the forms usually considered as comprising the entire range of energy so are the instruments required for its registration much higher than those used to determine the degrees of heat light electricity and magnetism it may be that the future will give us instruments adapted for the purpose in fact it begins to look even now as if the same were forthcoming but whether we have such mechanical instruments or not the living instruments give us a sufficient proof for the existence of the force and its operation well the writer still finds himself unable to bring the book to a close he added this chapter to show that the property of dynamic thought extended to the highest development of mind as well as abiding in the lowest and now that he has ventured upon the subject he finds himself impelled to give you a few instances of the workings and operations of that law in the case of human mental life and this means one more chapter but only one remember the book must come to an end some time remember and so we will pass over into another chapter which will be entitled thought in action End of chapter 15chapter 16 of dynamic thought or the law of vibrant energy by william walker atkinson this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roman Noble, RomanNoble.com. Chapter 16 Thought in Action. Without attempting to go into details or to enter into explanations, the writer proposes taking his readers on a flying trip through the region of thought in action or dynamic thought in operation in human life. The details of this fascinating region must be left for another and more extended visit in our next book before mentioned, which will be called The Wonders of the Mind. But he thinks that even this flying trip will prove of interest and instruction. Let us start with a hasty look at man himself. Not to speak of his seven planes of mind, which belongs to the next visit, we find him a very interesting object. Not only has he a physical body, apparent to our senses, but he has also a finer or astral body, which he may use, unconsciously or consciously when he learns how, for little excursions away from the body during his lifetime. This astral body is composed of substance just as his denser physical body. The field and range of substance extends far beyond the powers of ordinary vision, as even the materialist must admit when they talk of radiant matter, ethereal substance, etc. Then he has currents of fine force coursing through his nervous system, which may be seen by those possessing astral vision, if the teaching of the occultist be true. Then he, like the particle, has an aura or egg-shaped projection of mind and fine particles of psychoplasm which has been thrown off in the process of thought and which clusters around him producing a mental atmosphere which constantly surrounds him and makes itself felt by those coming in his presence those who read these words may remember readily the feeling they have experienced when coming in contact with certain people how some radiated an atmosphere of cheerfulness brightness etc while others radiated the very opposite some radiate a feeling of energy activity etc while others manifest just the reverse Many likes and dislikes between people meeting for the first time arise in this way, each finding in the mental atmosphere of the other some inharmonious element. These radiations are perceived by others coming into their range. Occultists tell us that the character of a man's thought vibrations may be determined by certain colors, which are visible to those having astral sight. There is nothing so wonderful about this, when it is remembered that the various colors of light comprising the visible colors of the spectrum, ranging from red, on through orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and terminating in violet, arise simply from different rates of vibration of the particles of substance. And as the thought is produced by mind causing vibrations in the psychoplasm, why is not the astral colors reasonable? We cannot stop to consider these colors in detail, but may run over the ones corresponding to each marked emotion of thought as reported by the occult teachings. For instance, the shade of the thought manifesting in physical or organic functions is of a colorless white, or color of clear water, and the color of the thought manifesting in fine force or vital energy is that of air, heated air arising from a furnace or heated ground, when it emerges from the body, although of a faint pink when in the body itself, black represents hate, malice, etc., gray, bright shade, represents selfishness, while gray of a dark, dull shade represents fear. Green represents jealousy, deceit, treachery, and similar emotions, ranging from the dull shades which characterize the lower and cruder forms to the bright shades which characterize the finer or more delicate forms of tact, politeness, and diplomacy, etc. Red, a dull shade, represents sensuality and animal passion, while red, bright and vivid, represents anger. Crimson in varying shades represents the phases of love, Brown represents avarice or greed. Orange represents pride and ambition, and yellow in varying shades represent grades of intellectual power. Blue is the color of the religious thoughts, ranging, however, through a great variety of stages, from the dull shade of superstitious religious belief to the beautiful violet of the highest religion emotion or thought. What is generally known as spirituality is characterized by a light blue of a peculiar luminous shade. Just as there are ultra-red or ultraviolet rays in the spectrum, which the eye cannot perceive, so occultists inform us there are colors in the aura or mental atmosphere of a person of unusual psychic or occult development. The ultraviolet rays indicating the thought of one who is pursuing the higher planes of occult thought and unfoldment, while the ultra-red is evidenced by those possessing occult development, but who are using the same for base and selfish purposes, black magic in fact. 
there are other shades known to occultists indicating several highly developed states of mind but it is needless to mention them here but the influence of these particles of thought stuff thrown off from the mind psychoplasm under the vibrations produced by the mind during the process of thought does not cease with the phenomena surrounding the aura they are radiated to a considerable distance and produce a number of effects particles are thrown off in great quantities each vibrating at the rate imparted to it during the process no these particles of thought stuff do not compose the thought waves the latter belong to a different set of phenomena these particles of vibrating thought stuff fly off from the brain of the thinker in all directions and affect other persons who may come in contact with them there is an important rule here however and that is that they seem to be attracted by those minds which are vibrating in similar thought rates with themselves and are but feebly attracted and in some cases actually repelled by minds vibrating on opposite lines of thought like attracts like in the thought world and birds of a feather flock together here as elsewhere some of these particles of thought stuff are still in existence and vibrating which proceeded from the minds of persons long since dead the same being emitted or thrown off during the lifetime of the persons however just as a distant star which was destroyed hundreds of years ago may have emitted rays which are only now reaching our vision years after the destruction of the star which emitted them and just as an odor will remain in a room after the object causing it has departed the particles still remaining and vibrating and just as a stove removed from a room may leave heat vibrations behind it so do these particles persist vibrate and influence other minds long after the person who caused them may have passed out of the body in this way rooms houses neighborhoods and localities may vibrate with the thoughts of people who lived there long ago but who have since passed away or removed these vibrations affect people living in these places to a greater or lesser extent depending upon circumstances but they may always be counteracted or changed if they are of undesirable nature by setting upon positive vibrations on a different plane of mind or character of thought the mind of a thinker is constantly emitting or throwing off these particles of thought stuff the distance and rate of speed to and by which they travel being determined by the force used in their production there being a great difference between the thought of a vigorous thinker and that emanating from a weak listless mind these projections of thought stuff have a tendency to mingle with others of a corresponding rate of vibration depending upon the character of the thought some remain around the places where they were emitted while others float off like clouds and obey the law of attraction which draws them to persons thinking along similar lines the characteristics of cities arise in this way the general average of thought of their inhabitants causing a corresponding thought atmosphere to hang over and around it which atmosphere is distinctly felt by visitors and often determines the mental character of the persons residing there in spite of their previous characteristics that is unless they understand the laws of thought some neighborhoods also have their own peculiar mental atmosphere as all may have noticed if they have visited certain tough neighborhoods on the one hand and neighborhoods of an opposite kind on the other certain kinds of thoughts and actions seem to be contagious in certain places and they are those who do not understand the law certain shops seem to have their own atmosphere some reflecting confidence and honest dealing and others radiating an atmosphere that causes patrons to hold tightly to their pocketbooks and in some extreme cases to be certain that their buttons are tightly sewed on their garments yes places like people have their distinctive mental atmospheres and both arise from the same cause and each person draws to himself these particles of vibrating thought stuff corresponding with the general mental attitude maintained by him if one harbors feelings of malice he will find thoughts of malice revenge hate etc pouring in upon him he has made himself a center of attraction and has set the law into operation his only safe course is to resolutely change his thought vibrations a most remarkable form of these particles of thought stuff is evidenced in the case of what are known among occultists as thought forms which are aggregations of particles of thought stuff energized by intense and positive thought and which are sent out with such intensity and positiveness that they are almost vitalized and manifest almost the same degree of mental influence that would be manifested by the sender if he were present where they are this highly interesting phase of the subject would take many chapters to describe in detail and we must content ourselves with a mere passing view to those who are interested in the subject the writer would say that he proposes considering them at considerable length in the forthcoming book the wonders of the mind which has been alluded to elsewhere
besides the operation of these particles of thought stuff emitted during the production of thought there are many other phases of thought influence or thought in action the principal phase of this phenomena arises from the working of the law of attraction between the respective minds of different people just as there are particles of substance united and connected by lines of connection so are the minds of men connected and the strong pull of desire manifest along these lines just as it does in the case of the atoms there has been much written of recent years regarding this drawing power of the mind and although some of what has been written is the veriest rubbish and nonsense yet under it all there remains a strong form substantial substratum of fact and truth men do attract success and failure to them people do attract things to them as strange as it may seem to the person who has not acquainted himself with the laws of underlying the phenomenon there is no miracle about all of this it is simply that the law of attraction is in full operation and that people of similar thoughts are drawn together by reason thereof the workings of this law are somewhat intricate but all of us are constantly using them consciously or unconsciously we draw to ourselves that which we desire very much or that which we fear very much for a fear is a belief and acts in the direction of actualizing itself sometimes but again as kipling would say but that's another story this phase of the subject is a mighty subject in itself and the half has not been told even by the many who have written of it the writer intends to try to remedy the deficiency in his next book however then again the excitement of thought in the minds of people may be transmitted or communicated to the minds of others and a similar vibration set up under certain conditions and subject to certain restraining influences just as in the case of the particles of substances in a body or mass of substance and in many ways that will suggest themselves to the reader who has mastered the contents of the earlier chapters of this book the phenomena of dynamic thought in the case of the atoms and particles may be and are duplicated in the case of individual minds of men the reader will see readily that this theory of dynamic thought and the facts noted in the consideration thereof give an intelligent explanation for the respective phenomena of hypnotism mesmerism suggestion thought transference telepathy etc as well as of mental healing magnetic healing etc all of which are manifestations of dynamic thought not only do we see as prentice mulford said that thoughts are things but we may see just why they are things and we may see and understand the laws of their production and operation this theory of dynamic thought will throw light into many dark corners and make plain many hard sayings that have perplexed you in the past the writer believes that it gives us the key to many of the great riddles of life this theory has come to stay it is no ephemeral thing doomed to die a borning it will be taken up by others and polished and added to and shaped and decorated but the fundamental principles will stand the stress of time and men of this the writer feels assured it may be laughed at at first not only by the man on the street but also by the scientist but it will outlive this and in time will come to its own perhaps long after the writer and the book have been forgotten this must be so for the idea of dynamic thought underlies the entire universe and is the cause of all phenomena not only is all that we see as life and mind as substance illustrations of the law but even that which lies back of these things must evidence the same law is it too daring a conception to hazard the thought that perhaps the universe itself is the result of the dynamic thought of the infinite o oh, dynamic thought we see in thee the instrument by which all form and shape are created changed and destroyed we see in thee the source of all energy force and motion we see thee always present and everywhere present and always in action verily thou art life and action thou art the embodiment of action and motion of which zittel hath said wherever our eyes dwell on the universe whithersoever we are carried in the flight of thought everywhere we find motion suns planets worlds bodies atoms and particles move and act at thy bidding amidst all the change of substance among the play of forces and among and amidst all the results therefrom there art thou unchanged and constant as though fresh from the hand of the infinite thou hast maintained thy vigor and strength and power throughout the aeons of time and likewise space has no terrors for thee for thou hast mastered it thou art a symbol of the power of the infinite thou art its message to doubting man
Let us close this book with the thought of the greatness of this thing that we call dynamic thought, which, great as it is, is but as the shadow of the absolute power of the infinite one, which is the causeless cause and the causer of causes. And in thus parting company, reader, let us murmur the words of the German poet who has sung. Dost thou ask for rest? See then how foolish is thy desire. The stern yoke of motion holds and harness the whole universe. Nowhere in this age canst thou ever find rest, and no power can deliver thee from the doom of activity. Rest is not to be found either in heaven or on earth, and from death and dying break forth new growth, new birth. All the life of nature is an ocean of activity, following on her footsteps without ceasing, thou must march forward with the whole. Even the dark portal of death gives thee no rest, and out of thy coffin will spring blossoms of a new life. Finney. End of chapter 16. End of Dynamic Thought, or the Law of Vibrant Energy, by William Walker Atkinson.